great to be here tonight. And I've got a lot of different things I want to talk about tonight. And uh, autism is a very, very big spectrum. And it goes all the way from uh, somebody who's going to remain nonverbal, all the way up to Einstein, who did no speech until age three, to the people that run Silicon Valley. You wouldn't have any Silicon Valley if it wasn't for a little bit of autism genes. You see, you get a little bit of that, you get somebody who's kind of a geeky nerd. I was back to geeking out on all the stuff I got backstage here, like they got a pig on a thing that will fly across the stage. I hope nobody lets that loose. There's a stuffed pig hanging back there. I found spears. I found like Harry Potter brooms back there. I've uh, been back there looking around all the things to figure out what plays they were doing. Because that's kind of the geek side of me. But it's a very, very big spectrum. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of early education intervention. By the time I was two and a half years old, I was getting uh, you know, 20 or 30 hours a week of speech therapy. Uh, my mother hired a nanny, played constant turn-taking games with me and my sister. When I was two and a half to three years old, I had all of the full-blown symptoms of autism. And the worst thing you could do with a young autistic two-year-old that's nonverbal, sitting in the corner, rocking, is nothing. You got to get some people to work with that kid. And don't get all hung up on getting a diagnosis. It might, you know, involve funding cutbacks. It may be hard to get services, but you got to start working with a kid. Get some grandmothers, get some students, get somebody to get in there and just keep them engaged. Playing little turn-taking games with them. And back in the 50s, and I was raised in the 50s, we did all kinds of things with uh, Chinese checkers and with um, board games and things like that. Also, being a child of the 50s, there were some expectations for behavior, like. Uh, Table manners, that was enforced. Uh, saying please and thank you, had to sit through church, there were some things that I just had to do. And it was good discipline. But I also was allowed to have some free time where I could veg out and go back into autism. So I think I get started with a few slides here. And what I want to try to get you thinking about is different kinds of minds. You see, a little bit of the autism genetics gives you a brilliant uh, head of Silicon Valley. We don't, I don't name any live people with Asperger's. You get too much autism and you've got a very, very severe handicap. Because you disconnect a few social circuits and then you get geek circuits. And geek circuits that do really interesting things like visual thinking, mathematics, stuff like that. Do not get hung up on diagnosis. Diagnosis is not precise. Mild autism, geek, nerd, successful businessman head of Silicon Valley, they are the same thing. <laughs> and I am saying that, I am saying that absolutely seriously, I'm not joking. And autism is a true continuous, uh, true continuum. And you know, you can kind of wire up a brain to be more social, maybe, or you can wire up a brain to be more thinking. I think there's a broad range of brains, sort of just within normal variation then obviously, of course, if we got no speech, other problems, that's certainly an abnormality. But it's a true continuous trait. And that's the reason why you know, autism exists. And it's also a complex genetics. You're not going to find an autism gene. It's a complicated genetics. Now, if you want to understand both animal and autism, things like math and art, you've got to get away from verbal language. One of my big concerns today is the educational system is getting totally verbal. I was just looking through some of my papers at home before I came here and I found a journal article that said that you know, the educational system today is sort of discounting visual thinking and visual spatial skills. Because the things that saved me when I was in school, the hands-on classes. But I want to try to get you to enter a world where it's not verbal language. And all the animals' world is all sensory. Now, the HBO movie did an absolutely fantastic job of showing how I think visually. There's a scene in there where a bunch of shoes just flash up in succession. That's how I think. Incidentally, the movie is on DVD. It also has a, a commentary track where I talk about autism and also about animal behavior. But I want to try to get you to enter a world that is not language-based. See, visual thinking is kind of a continuum. Some people are very visual, other people are not very visual. Now, thing is, there's a whole world of visual thinking and mathematical thinking that's hidden underneath language. When Van Gogh painted Starry Night, 
I don't think Van Gogh realized that he was uh, painting statistical models of turbulence and this. I mean, Van Gogh doesn't know anything about mathematics, but he was putting mathematics into Starry Night. There's also a type of Alzheimer's that has the frontal cortex, that's the brain's executive function, and the language parts of the brain get wrecked. Art talent comes out of somebody that was installing stereos in cars. Then eventually the, the brain is totally trashed. But the visual thinking is kind of hidden underneath verbal language. Now, both the animal mind and my mind pay attention to details. This is a test of what's called looking at detailed thinking versus gestalt. And the gestalt is looking at the whole. So you might flash one of these letters up there and you say to the person, I want you to pick out the little letters first or pick out the big ones. I picked out the little letters faster than the big ones. Details. But the thing is, we need to have people in this world interested in details. Because if the air traffic controller is not, wor not worried about details, there might be some plane wrecks. If somebody's building a bridge and they're not worried about details, you might have the bridge fall down. There's been research done the University of Pittsburgh shows that the normal mind drops out the details. And what I'm seeing today in all the mess we've got with all the politics and everything else is we're getting more and more people in policy positions that have never had practical experience with things. Now, if you take a normal person and you put them in the brain scanner, uh, those that they could, they, in this study, they took a normal person, they took a person with Asperger's, this is really mild autism, and then somebody with more severe autism. And you put them in a the scanner and have them read out of a book, and the autistic brain just gets the detail of the words. The Asperger brain gets both the syntax, the overall whole, and the details. But guess what happens to the normal person? The brain drops out the details. See, normal people being top-down thinkers tend to overgeneralize. So you get a lot of broad, abstract policies, and these abstract policies don't work out on the ground. And I'm seeing more and more problems with things getting more and more unrealistic because they don't have practical experience. I have found that on any issue, I don't care what it is, that um, things tend to get more radical when you have people that have no practical experience. We've got to be figuring things out from a practical standpoint. Now, in the early work that I did with livestock, um, I noticed when cattle were moving through the handling facilities, that sometimes the animals would refuse to move through the facility. And in this particular place here, the cattle did not want to go into the veterinary facility. And the feed yard thought, well, we're going to have to tear up this whole facility and just replace it. You know what was wrong? Is you got the flag there waving. And the flag has rapid movement, high contrast of light and dark, and it makes a real scary, scary noise. Why didn't people see the flag? It's right there but they're not seeing it. And when I first started, you know, in the early 70s, it was a real radical idea for to think about, to look at what cattle were seeing. I said, well, look, they don't want to go by that coat that's on the fence. They're balking at a reflection. There's a rope hanging across it. They can see a shiny uh, reflection off a car bomber. People were not noticing this detail. So they was just jamming the cattle through the chute. Look at how the animal is looking right at that blob of sunlight. I want to try to get you to be observed. Another thing you've got to look at very carefully when you're working with kids with autism is do I have a behavior problem or a biological problem? And one of the problems you can have in autism is sensory oversensitivity. Like I've had parents say, why is a child sticking his fingers in his ears? He's sticking his fingers in his ears because that school bell is hurting his ears. When I was a little girl and the school bell went off, it was like a dentist drill hitting a nerve. Now another child may, may hate fluorescent lights because they can see the flicker of fluorescent lights. Another child may be uh, having problems with the detergent aisle in the supermarket because of smelling all the strong smells. And, and there are some kids, if you take them in a big supermarket, they're just screaming and yelling because they feel like they're inside the speaker at the rock concert. And all these sensory problems get worse when the kid gets tired. My speech teacher would slowly enunciate hard consonant sounds. So you go in and have a hearing test. There is a difference between auditory detail and auditory threshold. Auditory threshold is the ability to hear very faint sounds. Auditory detail is the ability to hear the hard consonants. You know, when I was a little kid and I would say, like, fall, I'd go, bah, because I was not hearing the L's. So my speech teacher would enunciate and say, 
cat, cup, ball, then enunciate. So I would hear the detail. And some individuals that remain nonverbal, when they try to speak, they're just saying vowels because that's all they're hearing. And then there are some individuals where hearing will cut in and out like a bad mobile phone, especially when they're tired. Now I'd get down there in the shoots and see what the animals are saying, and on a sunny day, look at all the shadows he got. On a cloudy day, you don't have the shadows. They can see people through the side of the chute. They're really wild cattle, they're not going to want to walk up there. They're tame cattle, they would walk up there. It's a, it's a, the important thing I want to get across here is observing for sensory detail. And I'm always getting asked in my work, do the cows know they're going to get slaughtered? I get asked that question all the time. And when I first started my career, I had to figure out if the cows knew they got slaughtered. So I'd go to the swift plant, and then I'd go out to the feed yard and watch the cattle go up the chute. And they behaved the same way in both places. If they knew they were going to get slaughtered, they should be a lot wilder at the slaughter plant. What they were afraid of was the dark, seeing a reflection, seeing people up ahead, seeing a piece of plastic moving. You know, if you get rid of those things they're afraid of, then they would walk right up the chute. Now look here how the zebra and the horse have an ear on each other. I want to get you observant. I want to try to get you to enter a world without language. You're working with some of these kids that have problems, they don't think in language. There's a lot of different labels out there, autism, Asperger's, which is mild autism, you get attention deficit disorder, sometimes that gets mixed up with mild autism. Um, there's also a sense, there's problems where people just have sensory processing problems. Like visual system uh, has got problems where they can see the flicker of fluorescent lights, sound sensitivity. Uh, this is something that needs to have a lot more research. Now, this is a picture of a young man sent to me to show how he thinks with movies in his head. That is exactly how I think. And the movie did an absolutely great job of showing it. The HBO movie is very accurate from the standpoint of showing visual thinking, showing sensory problems, showing anxiety. And the geek side of me really likes the fact that they duplicated all my projects exactly. And there's a scene in the movie where they got all my drawings on the, uh, drawings on the conference room table, and those are my actual real drawings. That was a real drawing of a real job that was on that conference room table. Now, I learned that my thinking was different. When I wrote Thinking in Pictures back in the mid-90s, I started interviewing people about how they think. And I was shocked to learn that not everybody was a visual thinker like me. And I'm really interested in this whole idea of different kinds of minds. See, one of the things about the autism spectrum is they tend to have uneven skills. They're going to be good at one thing, and they're going to be bad at something else. And we need to be working on building up the area of strength and thinking about what is this kid going to do when he grows up? I'm a big believer in teaching job skills. You know, when I was 13 years old, I did a little sewing job. When I was 15 years old, I took care of nine horses. Also, when I was 15 years old, I built the gate that was shown in the HBO movie. I built that optical illusion room when I was about 16. You know, I was getting a lot of work experience. Well, I asked people, think about a church student. How does it come into your mind? And I was shocked to find out that most people see, saw this generalized generic student. I only see specific ones. You know, like in the movie, the word shoe is said, and a bunch of shoes came up in rapid succession. You know, if, when I think about a shoe, I see specific shoes. You know, if I said you think about your own house or your own car, most people are going to see their own house or car. But when I ask something where you're a little less familiar, I was shocked to find out that people got this vague image. Now neuroscientists know that this is coming out of the association cortex rather than out of the primary picture box. I see only specific ones. And they kind of flash up into my mind just like this. They just come up like this. Now if I stop on any of these pictures, then I can go, oh, you want to put some snow on it? Would you like to have a thunderstorm? I can start turning them into videos. <laughs> but the thing is, they are specific. You know, my concept of what a steeple is, is based on pictures of steeples I put in the steeple file folder in my brain. My concept of what a dog is, is based on pictures of dogs I put in the file folder in my brain. If I want to teach the child a concept, like not to run across the street, I got to teach it in many different locations, maybe seven or eight locations. 
Let's say I want to teach a child the concept of not being rude, for example. Well, you're going to need to just do it out there in the teachable moments. Okay, sticking your tongue out at the post office lady, that is rude. Okay, so you explain you don't do that. Spitting in public is rude. Uh, combing your hair with your fork is rude. Okay, so as the child uh, does these things, you just, you know, put those things in the rude uh, file folder. Pushing in line at the movie theater is rude. Um, you know, just, sh you know, if you were like, just shoving and pushing when you're getting off a plane is rude. You know, just teach it in the teachable moment. Like if I did something wrong, like uh, touching merchandise in the store, mother would just say to me, only touch the things you're gonna buy. Or if I ran behind the counter in the store, she said, well, only the clerks can, you know, go behind the counter. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing problems where I'm not, where kids are not expected to do enough different things. We've got to be careful about sensory overload. But I'm seeing smart verbal 12 year olds that can't order food at McDonald's. I think that's ridiculous. Because when I was like seven or eight years old, I knew how to do that, those kinds of things. I could go into the local uh, store and buy a kite or go in and buy a model airplane, and I knew how to do that basic shopping stuff. You know, you've got to push these kids some. But remember, no surprises. Surprises cause panic. I originally was kind of scared to go out to my aunt's ranch, but I knew about the trip three months ahead, ahead of time, and mother said, one week or all summer. It was a choice. Not going, it's not gonna be one of the choices. <laughs> now, being a visual thinker really was an asset in my equipment design. Because when I designed a piece of equipment, I could test run it in my head. I didn't know other people couldn't do this. And I saw some engineering mess ups that happened at some of the, some of the plant places that I worked, and I thought, how could they make that mistake? Couldn't they see that it was not going to work? Well, now I realize it's not stupidity. It's that they just did not see it. They just are not a visual thinker. And there's an aerial view of the dip vat that they reconstructed for the HBO movie. And it was actually a real working piece of equipment, all the cattle scenes, real cattle, real stuff. That really turned me on. And there's a drawing that was on the conference room table. Now the thing is, when you're a little bit weird, people don't want to talk to you. So the way I sold jobs is I show them my drawings. I made a portfolio of work. And there's a scene in the movie where I have a chance meeting with a lady and she likes my uh, shirt. And the shirt that I had on was a shirt that I had hand embroidered myself. I was wearing my portfolio. You see, when you're a little bit weird, you've got to sell your work rather than yourself. You can't emphasize that enough. And you never know who can open up the door. There's also a scene in the movie where I chase after the Arizona Fire Arrangement editor and get his car. I actually did that. <laughs> and then I did a similar thing with Gregory Pitrushek the editor of the National Division, and that was another meat magazine back in the, in the 70s. But, you know, sell your work more than selling yourself. Now, when I was in high school, I had a horrible, horrible time of being teased. And the only places where I was not teased was through shared interests. Things like horseback riding, model rocket club, electronics. Um, I've talked to a number of parents where, where boy scouting and girl scouting has been a wonderful activity because it's very, very structured. Let's talk about some other things we could do for work things today. You know, I think it's a shame there's no more paper routes because I put all the 13 year olds and 12 year olds on paper routes. Because these kids need to learn every day you gotta deliver those papers. Well, we don't have paper routes anymore, dog walking. That could be the new paper route. Because I want something you gotta do every single day for somebody else. Rain or shine, you're gonna have to do it. Because that teaches good work skills. I'm seeing smart kids on the spectrum graduating from college with no work skills. Now what do they do with those geeks and the nerds in other countries? Off to engineering school, off to computer school. I'm seeing a lot of smart kind of geeky kids now going nowhere. And, and, and you see the problem is, is that autism is such a big spectrum that special educators sometimes don't know what to do with the kids that are just kind of geeky. And what drives me crazy is recently I went up to a science fair up in Rochester, Minnesota and half the science fair there was little Asperger kind of geeky kids. And those kids go in all kinds of places and they're gonna end up working for tech companies and having really good jobs. And then I go to an autism meeting and the same little kids come up to me at the book table and all they wanna talk about is autism. And this brings up another thing. 
People have said to me, if I could snap my fingers, would I want to make myself not be autistic? No, because I like the logical way I think. But on the other hand, I'm a college professor first and scientist first, and autistic second. And I'd rather have this kid come up to me at the book table and tell me about his art, or tell me how he made scenery for the school play, or how he made this pig that's gonna, that could be slide across the stage any moment. You know, I'd much rather have him tell me about astronomy, or he likes to write science fiction. You know, autism is an important part of who I am, but it's not the whole thing of what I am. You see, people on the spectrum tend to get fixated on things. I got fixated on cattle sheets. I got fixated on building the optical illusion room. But those are things that actually ended up helping in my career. If I'd gotten fixated on autism, that wouldn't be help, help my career. So let's say you got a little kid and he's fixated on trains. He loves trains. Well, let's read a book about trains. Let's do math with trains. Let's draw pictures of places where the train goes. Make an associative link back to trains. Use that motivation. And there's another picture of the dipping vat. I got a really nice projector here in the stairs. So you can really see my drawings. And I have a class where I have my students lay out little cattle handling facilities. And I've learned some interesting things about perception. And it's also really good to have the students do something where they have to figure out how to design something. It teaches problem solving skills. This is the basic curve layout. You might want a white curve. Well, the cattle come on around the band. They think they're going back to where they came from. So we're using behavior. But one of the things that I had to learn when I first started, and I have to teach my students, is how to relate the lines on this drawing to the actual structure itself. So I'll switch back and forth. And then another thing that I did when I first started out was I took drawings and I walked through facilities. Because I had, I had to get to where the abstract lines related right to the real thing. Like, for example, that a big square, big square on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a drawing, that might be a pump house. If I had a little square, that might be a column that holds up the roof. If I had a big round circle, that might be a big water tank. You know, if I had another little building over here, that might be the cattle box. So switch back and forth. Now, I noticed a very interesting thing. Going from the 70s and 80s and the early 90s, when people started switching from drawing by hand to drawing on computer. And the old people, when they went onto the computer, that was fine. But I saw some really weird things happen with drawings. When some of the young 20-year-olds just went onto the computer, they'd never built anything, and they'd never drawn anything by hand. And I started getting drawings, and I got this from every major company that I worked with, with strange mistakes on them. Like they don't know where the center of a circle is, because they've never used a compass. Uh, they don't realize that drawing 25 foot long gates couldn't possibly work. Uh, they, they weren't drawing all the steps that should be in a ring. They were making perceptual mistakes. And every time I found these kind of mistakes, I found out that the person had never drawn by hand and they'd never pulled anything. And I'm very, very concerned about today I and mean, taking all the hands on things out of the schools. I think it's a gigantic mistake, huge, gigantic mistake, because you know, these kind of problems didn't happen before. And I think hands-on things teach problems. Like when I was a little kid, we'd like build tree houses and build forts. And doing these sort of things, you just gotta figure stuff out and learn how to do it. Like we thought, well, if we wet the lumber in the lawn sprinkler, it's gonna make it easier to cut. I can assure you it makes it a lot harder to cut. <laughs> and we never ever did that. And then they have mistakes like they don't take the compass function and actually swing a game. See if it's actually going to work. Uh, I've seen that say over and over again. Now, some little kids will show some really great skills when they're young, like around third or fourth grade, eight or nine years old, drawing skills or math skills. A lot of these kids that kind of have the brains that are different, you're going to have uneven skills. Really good at one thing and really, really terrible at something else. And I used to joke around that I had a huge internet connection that went deep into my visual cortex. And this is tensor imaging that measures the very, very, very large connections. And it turns out, yeah, I got a big internet trunk line going all the way back to the primary visual cortex. And when I got these pictures, I kind of go, wow. And then they took another picture, like right up here, and that was really super quick. You know, mainline internet connection, you know, and then some other research that was done. 
uh, my entorhinal cortex was enlarged, and that's part of the brain's graphics card. Now, the movie did a great job of showing how anxious I was. Well, my fear center was enlarged. And I've been on antidepressant medication for 30 years. And us visual thinkers, you know, autistic or non-autistic, and I know a lot of design professionals and a lot of movie kind of producer people where a little bit of Prozac really, really makes a difference. Just a little bit. Because it damps down the horrendous anxiety. And in my book, Thinking in Pictures, I've got a whole section on medication in there. And I'm absolutely appalled at the amount of powerful drugs given out to five year olds like candy. It is just appalling. Now, there is a place to use medication in a careful, conservative way. And the movie shows me before I went on medication in my early 30s. A little tiny dose of antidepressant can sometimes really make a big difference. And the trick with people on the spectrum is little tiny doses. The mistake that's made is much too high a dose. Let's say you take a drug like Prozac and you start to get agitation and insomnia. The dose is too high. Then you've got to cut it back. Uh, now, another kind of mind is what I call a pattern thinker. I'm a photorealistic visual thinker. But another mind, and this is not mine, thinks in patterns. It's a more abstract visual thinker. And it's been researched with PET scans and other brain scans to show that the visual thinker like me and the pattern thinker, it actually uses slightly different parts of the brain. But this is much more mathematical. And to give you a glimpse into a mind that's not mine, I found this picture of this praying mass is extreme origami. That praying mass is made out of a single sheet of folded paper. There's no scotch tape and no cuts were made in the paper. And what you see in the background is the folding pattern. It's not my mind, but it's, uh, it's the mind of the program, the mind of the engineer. This is probably the most important slide that I've got tonight. It really illustrate the concept of different kinds of minds. I am a photorealistic visual thinker. Absolutely could not do algebra. It's too abstract. And one of the mistakes that was made with me was we didn't go to geometry. Because I'm finding an awful lot of students that cannot do algebra, but they can do geometry. Now the verbal thinkers are going to say algebra is a prerequisite for geometry. Not if you're a geometry thinker. There's a book called Perfect Rigor about a famous mathematician. And in the very beginning of that book, they said there's two ways of thinking about math. There's the algebraic equation, like a squared plus b squared equals c squared, or you can do it with a diagram. You take a right triangle, and then you put squares on each side of it, and that is the figure that means that same equation. That's the pattern way of doing it. And the pattern people often have trouble with algebra. There are brilliant mathematicians who can hardly do algebra but they're, you know, they're doing this great geometry trick and calculus. I think it's hard for people to realize that there are different kinds of minds. And the pattern thinker kids often have a lot of problems with reading. So the kid may need to be five grades ahead in math, but he may need tutoring in reading. See, it's uneven skills. And then another line is the verbal fact model. This kid's not a visual thinker. He knows everything about his favorite baseball team, or movies or whatever, basketball, whatever his favorite thing is. These kids are just uh, sort of so so in math, and they are not visual thinkers. And then there's other people where they are more of an auditory thinker, where hearing is their best sense. They learn best through auditory, where I learn best through seeing. And then some kids are going to learn to read with phonics, and others with sight words. You know, the bottom line is we want to make sure we get them reading. Now, the thing about the different kinds of minds is that they complement each other. You need both kinds of minds. You know, the visual thinkers you know, can do it work like industrial design, that's what I do, but you still have to have engineers to figure out some of the steel stresses and stuff on some of the stuff I've designed. You know, you take a product like the iPod music player, a fine arts major designed the whole idea of how that works. The engineers had to figure out how to make it work. So the artist kind of gives the user experience. Engineers do the innards. And it's really important that they work together because on the iPhone 4, they didn't work together quite as well. <laughs> and, you know, you know, a pretty little phone, and they disobeyed the antennas 101, and they put the antenna on the outside and put your hand against it, it messes up your reception. So now you have to put an ugly case on it to make it work. And 
in consumer reports with duct tape on it. I, you know, did, you know the, the, the visual thinker and the pattern thinker didn't quite work together the way they should have. Now, the HBO movie was a perfect example of two kinds of different kinds of minds working together. Because Mick Jackson, the director, absolute visual thinker. But he made sure that every time he changed the script, he consulted with the writer. Because you need to have the writer for the structure. Otherwise, you get something that's very, very disjointed. You need the different kinds of minds to really have good projects. And then a good project manager knows how to have, you know, have those minds work together. Like in some of my research, my students are very, very good at doing the statistics. But what I'm good at is the methods. I was on the phone last night with my student. He's getting to see his thesis uh, done. And his results in the experiment came out a little different than what he thought they were going to be. And I said, go back and look at the method section of every other paper. Well, then you find a reason. It's a difference in the methods. You know, you need to do the statistics, but you also got to look at what, what did it actually do with these cases. And the differences that we found, it was all in the methods. So I want you to really, really think about different kinds of minds. Now, how do you form a concept when I have all these specific pictures? This brings up another important thing. I am a bottom-up thinker. To form a concept, I have to put specific examples into file folders in my brain. And this is a picture of a young autistic man gave to me showing how he's putting dog and cat pictures in different files. It's bottom up, it's not top down. Concept consists of a whole lot of specific examples. Okay, and categories. I find that a lot of people have problems figuring out categories. Like, do I have a behavior problem with this kid or a biology problem? Like maybe hidden pain or medical problem or sound sensitive. Dogs do categories. When I'm on the leash, I protect my own. When I'm off the leash, I can go pluck. Or if you have a service dog, when you got the vest on, you got to do work behaviors. And when you got the vest off, you can play. And you don't want to be confusing the dog by rolling around on the floor with it with the vest on. You're going to do that with the dog, take the vest off. Don't confuse it. It needs to have clear categories. But I find that a lot of people, when they're trying to troubleshoot something, have a hard time categorizing, like I find with my cattle stuff. Like, well, to this plant, is there some kind of problem there? Is it a people problem? Or is it an equipment problem? I find people seem to have a very difficult time saying equipment problem versus people problem. How about categories? I was just reading a Fortune article about British Petroleum. And they were so proud of the fact that they cut down slips and falls and people that, you know, knocking their head on a pipe or something in their oil rigs. You know, their personal safety had gone away. So, yeah, they managed to prevent all the little accidents, but they've got about process safety. Like, you know, three broken parts on a blog preventer, and the whole rig explodes, you know, that side. Uh, maybe a little more important than uh, putting the lid on a coffee cup so you don't fall down and break one. Uh, you know, they didn't quite have the categories right. Now, animals make categories. I'll just give you another example of that. A horse will differentiate between a man on my back or a man on the ground. Cattle do the same thing. Cattle that are accustomed to being worked on horseback, maybe really, really tame. You can get right up close to them. But you walk out there on foot, they scatter. You see a man on a horse, a man on the ground, that's two different things. Now you can train them to tolerate both. Or you can have a horse that's been abused by a rider. He's going to buck and kick when you try to ride him. But then, when you work with him on the ground, he's fine. You know, like doing shoeing or veterinary. Or you can have a horse that's been abused by the horseshoer. You can ride him, but he's going to be horrible for anything you do on the ground. You see, it's a different picture. You know, animals actually make sensory-based categories. Both well, animals and people with autism are bottom-up thinkers rather than top-down. Now, there's some kinds of work where bottom-up thinking really works, especially like, you know, medical diagnosis, because you kind of go, oh, well, you know, I had this one over here and that one over here, and this is kind of similar, and you're putting similar things into categories. It's bottom-up, it's not top-down. I learn every concept by putting many different specific examples into file folders on things like teaching social skills, let's get out in the real world. 
being brought up in the 50s. There were expectations for sitting through Sunday dinner. You know, church was an activity that we did. I had to sit it through it. I didn't have to like it, but I had to behave. And I had to, um, you know, put on these horrid little straw hats. I hated awful stockings and garden belts, all these awful clothes they had back then. And, um, you know, be on time and do it. You know, I was allowed to have some downtime after lunch where I could, like, twirl things and, you know, veg out in my room. But there was some expectations for behavior. But on the other hand, you can't force a kid into sensory overload. There are some where they can't tolerate going in the big supermarket. And one of the ways to help a child to tolerate maybe the school bell or the smoke alarm is if the child initiates the dreaded sound. He turns it on himself. Maybe just for like half a second, then gradually get where he can tolerate more and more of it. Now let's give some other examples of teaching using specifics. Let's say I want to teach about the word up. I kite it up in the air. I walk up the stairs. I go up a hill, up in the attic. Lift up a cup. I got to teach him all these specific examples. Because if I just talked about going up the stairs, he's going to think up only applies to going upstairs. I got to teach up playing goes up in the air. I drove a car up the hill. These are things that you can just teach out in the world. We need to be doing a lot more teachable moments. Like, if I was sitting at Sunday dinner, and I reached across the table for the mashed potatoes, mother would say, ask your sister to pass it. If I chewed my mouth open, mother would say, get your mouth closed. I find a lot of little kids on the spectrum come up to me at meetings and they don't know how to shake hands. Nobody has showed them how to shake hands. They put a dead fish out there, or they put the left hand out there. I just take the kid's hand and I just show them how to shake hands. I don't know, just in that last month, I probably run into five or six of those. You know, teach a kid how to shake hands properly. That's not hard. You see, I think today's the looser society is, is, is hurting some of these kids. You know, the, you know, I remember one time I went out with a dad and this kid, we stopped at a gas station and this kid like goes in the store and he throws candy on the floor. I wouldn't have been allowed to do that. The thing I thought was interesting is he never tried to touch the gas pump. Parents had reflexively stopped that because that's so dangerous. But throw candy on the floor in the store? Yeah, he's doing that. Teaching math. You've got to teach them that math concepts apply to many different objects. They apply to small objects, big objects, food, dogs, houses. I can have two houses, two cars, two pennies, two bottle caps, two pens. Teach subtraction. Here I got five pieces of candy and I eat two. Well, I got three left. That's subtraction. Teach fractions. Like when, let's say, you get a pizza. Use a teachable moment. We're going to cut the pizza up into pieces. We cut an apple up into pieces. That's teaching fractions. Okay, I've got this bottle of water and I drank a bunch more of it. <laughs> well, now I've drank one fourth of the bottle of water. That's teaching proportion. You know, use those teachable moments. You know, I think there's too much of teaching social skills in the vacuum. No, it was just done in the teachable moments. And the thing is, you know, if I did something out in the neighborhood, you know, the other parents, you know, they would tell my mother. Like one day I rolled around on the floor in a little post office candy store, and Dino, who runs the candy store post office, called my mother. I was in trouble for that. Not okay? Well, also another thing, you can sometimes get a kid or an animal that just seems to be afraid of something for no reason. Like a kid doesn't want to go into this classroom anymore. Or he won't go into this particular room. Because maybe last week a mic fed back and went, eee! Or the smoke alarm gone. Now he can see the smoke alarm and he's afraid of it. Well, animals can get similar things. Here's a horse who was definitely afraid of black cowboy hats. He'd been abused by a guy wearing a black hat. White hat had no effect. See, it's very specific. If I put the hat down on the ground, now it was still scary, but then as I lifted the hat up, and I got it closer and closer and closer and closer to my head, the more scary the hat got. You know, we've got different kinds of minds, and we've got to, like, help them all to work together. And the thing that's worrying me is I'm seeing smart little geeky kids that ought to be, you know, going to Silicon Valley, ought to be solving the energy crisis going nowhere. And I think I'm really getting concerned that our schools just don't value visual spatial thinking, hands-on stuff. Uh, it's getting all verbal. And the thing is, it, is kids, if you, if you work uh, math and reading and stuff into the hands-on stuff, kids are probably going to do better on the test. 
but it teaches problem solving skills. I'm getting really worried that we're not uh, doing that. So I'm seeing you know, too many smart kids get addicted to video games. I'm the kind of kid that if video games had been around in the 60s, I would have gotten addicted to them. Well, instead of out there working with the horses and things like that, programming, I couldn't do programming. I had access to the same computer that Bill Gates had access in 1968, and I couldn't program it. That's just not my kind of mind. And for every kid that's capable of programming video games, there's 10 or 15 others that are video game addicts. In fact, today, in one of the newspapers, I had a New York Times and a Wall Street Journal on the plane. I have them all mixed up, so I don't remember which one it was, but it was today's paper. I read that the video game companies are having a hard time finding qualified programmers. You know, because the thing is, to learn how to program games, that's hard work. And the thing I've learned about those kind of skills, kids don't learn that by osmosis. So this is where my science teacher, really up and turn around. He was shown this absolutely beautifully in the movie. You know, we've got to help these unique students to be successful. Too many of them are getting into criminal stuff because it didn't have someone to teach them auto mechanics, teach them science, teach them stuff they can turn into a career. Mentors are essential. I was saved by my science teacher. And a lot of these kids are ending up at the community colleges because that's where the good teachers are because you don't have to have a teaching certificate. I think it's absolutely absurd that to teach high school chemistry, let's say you've worked in chemistry all your life, you've got a master's in chemistry, that you have to have a teaching certificate to teach high school chemistry. I think that's just ridiculous. Maybe for elementary school you need that, but not for high school chemistry. Because you've got all these baby boomers now that are aging that would love to go into a second career and maybe teaching a chemistry class or a biology class or a psychology class or an English class. No, I think they have to have a degree in their discipline and I'd want to pick people where professionally, for at least a good portion of their career, they worked in their degree area. So you'd get the work idea into it. But of all the lack of science teachers, I'm really concerned about taking out the hands-on classes. I was just up at this um, Minnesota Science Fair, and a lot of the projects up there were not expensive. In fact, we were just back in the stage, just looking at all the stuff back here. You've got the full Broadway stage equipment back here. And it's really cool things you can do with these lights, with things like called scrims. They're not even expensive. It's like gauzy cloth and you light it in different ways, you can see through it in different ways, it's like really, really super cool. Well, you've got to have somebody who's really into lights that show you how to do that. The thing I've learned on a lot of these things is someone has to show you how to do it. Because when I was in my 20s, I painted signs. And I painted signs for five years with the wrong brush. Because the brush that works really well, when you look at it at the art store, it's such a soft, furry thing, I'm going, well, how can I use that? No, you have to soak them in lard oil and, and shape it. Somebody has to show you that, or you have to read it in a book. You know, there are things you just have to be taught by people who really know it. We need to be giving the different kinds of minds opportunity. And this is stuff I was doing, carpentry work, riding horses. If I hadn't had these activities when I was in high school, I would have gone nowhere. These things saved me. Now, you know, there's a lot of different diagnostic labels. I think oppositional defiance is a lot of rubbish. You know, autism is a real thing. You've got all kinds of different kinds of dyslexia. Uh, but we need to be looking at some of these sensory issues. I had a student that was dyslexic, where, where fluorescent lights were so much like being in a disco and in a strobe light that she just couldn't function. You know, the 60 cycle fluorescent lights. In the future, we'll get lighting technologies that don't flicker. But right now, as they get phased out, the, you know, the regular old incandescent light bulbs. This is going to be a real problem for a lot of people. I can tell you, if I had this problem, I'd be hoarding them. And now I'd go down to Costco and buy them a case and hoard them. <laughs> because for some people, when they go to read, the print will jiggle on the page. And one of the ways that you can stop that is trying on colored glasses. You know, like go down to Walmart and try on the light pink ones, maybe some light blue ones. Do you find some where the light doesn't where the print doesn't jiggle anymore. See, back here in the back of the brain, there's circuits of shape, color, motion, and texture. They know where they're located, but scientists have absolutely no idea how they work. And there's something wrong with that. Because I talked to a guy with a hockey puck and hit him in the back of the head right, right in the visual cortex, and he got that same problem, busted up the uh, systems that make the graphics fight go together. And why would colored lenses help that? I don't know. Sometimes printing the homework on colored paper helps. 
Laptop computer screens don't flicker. iPods are probably, you know, iPads are probably okay, but some computer screens flicker and are just unusable. There's a little kid putting his hands over his ears, already talked some about sound sensitivity. Another problem that brains have, the quirky brains have is attention shifting slowness. Like if a cell phone goes off out over here and I pay attention to that, it takes me much longer to shift back. And I'm turning away from the sign language interpreter because I've got to screen out her motion. If, she's, if I let her get into my periphery, I can't screen that out. So that's why I'm turning away from her. You know, it, 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 I, 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 but you see, but that's a problem that I have with attention shifting. My attention shifting is slow. I have a lot of problems with multitasking. Now, there's a lot of entry jobs, entry level jobs, where you've got to multitask. But there's a lot of professional jobs like designing work. You don't have to multitask. And here's a problem where the student can see the print jiggle on the page. And I had a student that had this problem. I am finding in my livestock handling class, I have 60 every semester. I have one or two every semester that I absolutely cannot draw. If I ask them to make a line, and then I want three half circles along that line, they can't do it. It's And I said, what are you seeing? And they said, they're seeing waves in between the lines. You know, and they certainly aren't going to be a visual thinker if they have a problem. That just shows some of my books. What I want to do right now is, oh, I mentioned the developing talents. That is my employment book. And we need to be getting a lot more into teaching people work skills. And I, I, I was a goofball student when I was in high school. High school was a terrible time for me in terms of teasing, but I was getting a lot of work skills. I worked out in the Ants Ranch. I actually built the gate that's shown in the movie. It worked just like it was shown in the movie. I was 15 years old. I was uh, taking care of nine horses. When I was in college, I was doing an internship at a research lab. I'm seeing smart guys graduate from college and I haven't done any work stuff. I think that's absolutely ridiculous. You know, sometimes these kids are coddled too much. You can't push somebody into sensory overload stuff that they can't tolerate. But, and the other thing is, no surprises. But you've got to always push a bit. You've got to get these kids out and show them interesting stuff. If I hadn't seen the optical illusion room in that movie, I wouldn't have made the optical illusion room. And that was very accurately shown. In like fact, the original Bell Labs movie that I saw in the 60s, they showed in the HBO movie. But if you don't show kids interesting stuff, then they don't get interested in interesting stuff. But you always got to push some. And I'm seeing too many of these kids, you know, down in the basement, they're now 25, 30 years old, they're down in the basement playing video games, and they're on welfare, uh-uh. No. And we've got to, uh, uh, I'll just end up and say, and one little geek gets to go to Silicon Valley, and another little geek goes to Hollywood, and another little geek ends up in the basement on Social Security, and they're all the same geeks. And, and, and I have a lot of problems with that. And I notice that as I travel around the world. One of the problems we have with autism is at one end of the spectrum, you've got brilliant people that could be brilliant scientists, engineers, artists. And at the other end of the spectrum, you've got people that get the right training. They could do a simple job, they could cook. They, may, they could uh, do daily living skills. And if you don't do any training with them, they won't even be able to get dressed by themselves. Autism is a very broad uh, spectrum. And a little bit of the genetics, it gives you Silicon Valley. It gives you computers. It gives you all kinds of things. And I think I'll just uh, end right there. And then we're going to open up for some questions. We're supposed to have some mics that roll around. And I want to thank everybody for coming. And then we'll do some questions. Okay, the question was, how am I handling all the celebrity status? Uh, I consider it a big responsibility. And, uh, you know, I'll never get a fat head or anything like that. Uh, it's a responsibility. I try to answer all the mail. Uh, I, gotta, I feel it's a responsibility to give people practical, common sense advice. And, and just to answer one other question that I get asked all the time in autism, People are always looking for a magic turning point, a magic breakthrough. There's not. It's a slow learning more and more and more and more as I put more and more data into the database. Okay, I'm going to pick some. Uh, 
Okay, I can't. Maybe we can get the mic so everybody can hear. I was wondering, <laughs> I was wondering, um, I was thinking about sea mammals because, because, well, most of the predators I've seen rely on instinct. And um, even if you put like the shark in a tank or something, it just like, Well, let's talk about, I'm going to answer your question, question about instinct. Um, there is another more scientific word for instinct, what's called fixed action patterns. Like, for example, when bulls fight, they butt heads. When stallions fight, they rear up like, hee 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 hee, like that. Now, it's both aggression, but the, 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 the instinct is the pattern in which it fights. Bulls butt heads, and horses rear up and strike. Another instinct is prey drive, you know, rapid movement. It makes predatory animal like dogs and wolves, it makes them checks. And it tends to make horses and cattle run away. That would be instinct. But an animal's not just all instinct, because wolves wouldn't be able to hunt if they couldn't plan. You know, you know they have to figure out how to catch the prey. That requires some planning and thinking. So an animal's not just all instinct. Well, the thing is, is, you go, you know, a shark has got a smaller brain than a dog does. So, shark is probably more driven by instinct or fixed action patterns than a dog would be. Well, um, when I went to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, um, there was a turtle inside with the other with the other sharks. And I, uh, and the last time I went there, there were shark. The turtle, I think, the shark was thinking. Mmm, that looks good to eat. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I think it might depend upon the relative size from the turtle and the shark. Maybe we'll better go on another question. <laughs> okay, right here. Back in the 50s, they didn't... There were no autism support groups and things like that. Normally, autistic kids were just put in an institution. But I did get some very good early educational innovation, and Mother could see that I was pulling out of it. So what you're saying is, like, having mentors on your side would be able to make a huge difference within your life? Well, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, my science teacher was one of the really important mentors, because I didn't know I was getting all these work skills. I wasn't studying. I had no interest in studying. And he got me interested in studying because now I had a goal of becoming a scientist. And if I wanted to become a scientist, then I'd have to study some stuff I wasn't that interested in, like English and history, because that was part of, of uh, becoming a scientist. You know, mentors can really help get the kids turned around. And I'm seeing a lot of these boys are getting labeled oppositional, defiant, stupid things like that, because they don't have an auto shop teacher or the welding teacher or someone like that to get them turned around. And there's actually a shortage in, in the U.S. right now on certain hands-on occupations like certified welding and machinists, because I read a lot of business stuff. And those are good jobs. I'm not going to send those jobs over to China. They can't fix cars from another country. Okay, right down here. In your book, Developing Talents, does it talk mainly about developing the talents of an autistic child, or are we talking about a whole population? Because you can see that that's true even in normal Well, it's true, true in normal kids, kids too. Absolutely. You know, there's a lot of the different kinds of, you know, quirky kinds of minds. Let's just back up here, just, uh, you know, look back and list all these labels. You know, there's a lot of different labels. And the thing you got to realize about these labels is their behavioral profiles. These are not accurate diagnoses like diagnosing tuberculosis, where you either have tuberculosis or you don't have tuberculosis, or you have hepatitis or you don't have it. And, and they basically are behavioral profiles. 
and half the time the directions on how to apply the behavioral profile aren't you know, done correctly. Right now with DMS-5, they're fighting over, you know, uh, getting rid of the Asperger's and merging that into autism. And, and uh, you know, what I have found, brains that are a bit different, and they're some of the most creative people, they tend to be uneven skills. You know, and they end up getting the label, like there's a lot of guys that end up in prison and in trouble with the law, and a lot of them are really good artists. And they ought to be going to a career in art. Nobody, you know, kind of moved them that way. I think there needs to be a lot more in looking at when kids get to middle school, what are they going to do when they grow up and train them so they get good jobs using their skills. In the movie, in your early years, you didn't want to be touched. And, um, and then later on, you developed the squeeze shoe where you got inside, you know, and, uh, and you enjoyed the, the ability of being squeezed. Now, later on, do you now enjoy being hugged? Oh, I like being, I like being hugged now. You see, this is where you can desensitize some of these things. You're not going to get scratchy wool against my skin, but you can gradually desensitize to the hugging, you know, where you just keep trying to do it a little bit more. Light tickle touches tend to be alerting, and firm pressure tends to be calming. You know, but then one of the places where they really need to be doing research is on these sensory problems, because they can be very debilitating. I mean, I know people are living in a darkened room, but you have to kind of push a little bit to try to get tolerate things a bit more. One of the basic principles is if the child or the adult initiates it, it's often easier to tolerate. So you might push the button on the fire alarm, the smoke alarm, one that you've wrapped up in a towel, just a little bit, and then you gradually take the towel off. And, or let's say the child can't tolerate going in the supermarket, then uh, we go in the supermarket, but then when he gives a signal like this, then we're going to leave the supermarket. Also, work on this when the child is not tired. When they're tired, all these problems get worse. But if there's one place where they really need research, it's on these sensory issues. And why is it taking so long to do research on this? I think it's hard for people to imagine an ultimate sensory reality, where sound that doesn't bother you is like a dentist drill hitting a nerve to me. You know, they've done 15,000 papers on the social stuff and brain scans on that. You probably have 200 papers on face neurons and things like that, very paper on sensory. But how can you possibly be social if you can't even tolerate being in the noisy places where people socialize? You know, one of my top priorities in research, not just for autism, but for a lot of other disorders as well, is these sensory sensitivities. And the problem is they're very variable. If you take 20 kids with autism, maybe two or three have the visual problem. Maybe, maybe five or six of them have really bad sound sensitivity problems. Then there's others that have uh, touch sensitivity problems. It's very variable, and these sensory problems are not the same across all. Um, how do you find that now they're using uh, dogs to calm the kids with autism, or you know they want to care for a dog, and that's a responsibility? And um, are you, do you find that animal care, or specifically having a companion dog, is helping the kids? Well, for some kids it can be helpful. Some kids just naturally bond with dogs, and then there's others that don't like dogs because they don't know when they're going to bark, and that's going to hurt their ears. You know, I just talked to a lady that uh, raises service dogs, and she said that some people have unrealistic expectations of what the dog is going to do. They're looking for a magic fix. Now, one place where I'm hearing some really great things is with therapeutic riding. I've probably talked to about seven or eight sets of parents now where their kid did their first words on a horse. And I think the reason for that is sensory, because when you're riding, you're getting rhythmic activities and balancing activities at the same time. And that rhythmic activity and that balancing activity stimulates the vestibular system. And for some unknown reason, nobody knows why it works, it seems to help stabilize the nervous system. You know, I'm a bottom-up thinker, so I'm not going to make up some theory that's probably going to be wrong. I'd rather just say this seems to happen in certain kids. It's a difficult thing to study because if you took 20 kids with autism, maybe this only works on one of them. But there is a subgroup where this has happened enough times uh, and on a therapeutic riding, it's happening when the kid is on the horse. Not petting it, not putting the tack on, not leaning around, riding it's when it happens.
My son is seven and he's autistic and we have a lot of help for him in his school and outside of the school. But we're going to be moving to a new home and I'm wondering what are some important things to consider? Moving to a new home? Uh, one of the things is no surprises. If it's possible, uh, if it's in another state, you can't visit the house, but maybe could you look at the house on the real estate website? Uh, you want to try to make it not uh, a surprise. You know, if the house is like far away in another state, if you could get some pictures of the house, both inside and out. Now, if you were just moving to a new school across town, then I'd want to visit the new school. What you want to do is take the surprise factor out of it. So they know as much about it as possible. Like, like what's his new school going to look like that he's going to go to? So I want to get some pictures of his new school. What's his new classroom going to look like? And you'll contact the school and get them to email you some pictures. That's going to help make us less scary. You want to take the surprise element out. Now, when designing the home, we'll have kind of a blank slate. How would you design? Well, the thing is, is your, is your child one that's bothered by fluorescent lighting? Uh, you can get special electronic fluorescent lighting that's a higher frequency. If you can, I'd be hoarding the light bulbs now at Costco. <laughs> no, I'm serious about that. Uh, they, some kids that have visual problems don't like a lot of stripes and kind of contrasty stuff. I love stripes. When I earned some money in my little sewing job, I went out and I bought these hideous striped shirts that my mother really hated <laughs> because I liked stripes. I liked visual stimulating things, where another kid would hate those shirts because the stripes would all be vibrating. So this is where it's very And if I was, in general, in designing a school, I'd want to get rid of the 60 cycle, you know, electricity fluorescent lights. That's the thing that, that I'd want to get rid of, if possible. And if you're stuck with that, then you can put a 100 watt light next to the desk. New lighting technologies are going to come in because this fluorescent light problem probably bothers up to 10%, 5 to 10% of the public. I mean, it is going to have to be addressed. But until it is addressed, it's going to be probably the single worst thing, you know, that you could have in a school. You know, there's some kids where all the lots of decorations on the wall is just great. You see, you got to figure out what kind of kid you have. Sometimes some of them are very sensitive to a lot of um, glues that are used in carpets and, and uh, you know, glues used in plywood and things like that, and some are not. But the most important thing is I get lots of pictures of the school, the house, uh, any friends you might already know in the new town, get pictures of them, let the kid talk to them on the phone, maybe even on a Skype or something where they, you know, they can see them. So in other words, you want to get as much of the surprise element out as possible. Okay. I can't see up there. Yep. Yeah, I can see it now. I wanted to go back to your example of the steeple. Yep. You think of the, you think of specific steeples. I see think of specific steeples, that's right. Do you have trouble recognizing cartoons or pictograms? Things that are very abstract line drawings? Well, I can understand, I can understand what those are. You okay. know, where it's just a few little lines and it's a guy's face, or a few little lines and it's a dog or something. Yeah, I can understand those. Okay. I was curious about that. Yeah, I can, I can understand line. those. and. Uh, Okay, somebody's down here with a white. Uh, well, maybe I can just tell me if you can make it really short and I'll repeat it. What do you mean by negative language? So you're saying there's a lot of kids that are talking about death and things like that? <clears throat> All right, the first thing you want to look at if they're talking about kind of bad stuff like that is has a kid been abused? Is he coming out of an abused, abusive background? And then the other thing I'd want to try to do is try to get away from that sort of stuff. Get, try to get him interested in other things. You know, like, uh, uh, you know, if the kid's a visual thinker, let's get him to do pictures of stuff that's nicer stuff. If the kids got mechanically inclined, maybe get interested in auto mechanics. You know, it, you know, try to get them interested in other things, get them off those subjects.
But I have seen some cases where they put a lot of bad, write a lot of bad pictures and things, and the kid's been abused. So you've got to rule that out, or at least you know try to find out what's going on. Okay, right here. The question was, you got a seven-year-old, he's going to be mainstream, should the, should the teacher alert the other children? I think some of it depends upon how severe he is. Obviously, if he's only partially verbal, I think the teacher better explain some things to the other children. She's really, really brilliant. Uh, well, you know, the thing that kind of drives me crazy is these kids that are really brilliant, socially awkward, used to be labeled gifted. <laughs> and, I, and I'm saying this as an assertion, I have had a... Uh, I have had uh, parents come up to me and they got a kid, you know, a 10 year old boy with an IQ of 150, and they want to put him on Social Security because he's socially awkward, and, and the kid's brilliant. Now, you've got to, I had to learn some things like uh, learning not to tell people off, but get the kid involved <laughs> in things where there's shared interests. When I was seven years old, I'd go fly kites with other kids. I was very good at building and making kites. And other people thought that was fun, or, or making uh, uh, airplanes, different kinds of airplanes that would fly and things like that. Uh, when I was in high school, you know, shared interests. When I was in college, you know, I kind of had some social breakthroughs when I was in the school talent show. You know, get the kid involved in things like band, drama. You know, some of these awkward, uh, awkward kids are really great at stage stuff because you gotta always just act in the play. You gotta act in the play. That's uh, that's what you do. I think a lot of things you gotta kind of you know just sort of see how things are going. Then you get into the whole issue of disclose or not disclose. I never disclosed anything except for specific needs, like I couldn't stand the noise or I don't want a multitask. I don't I, I don't walk up to people that don't know and say, well, I tell them I have autism. I might tell them, well, I have a little hearing problem, and let's go outside because I don't hear well in this background. I just tell about the specific thing. <laughs> yep. Dr. Brandon, what about, what is your um, thoughts on children who script constantly? What do you mean by script? Be specific. Talking to themselves. Oh, talking to themselves? And, and have a real difficulty in breaking through. I mean, we were doing some behavioral approaches, but, you know, what's I used to talk to myself, tell stories to myself, and I, there were, I had times where I was allowed to do it, like at night in my room. You know, I think, you know, there's times I was allowed to do it. Other times, like dinner table, we were not going to have any stimming or any, you know, twirling a fork up around in the air or anything like that. But then after lunch, I could have an hour to myself where I could do that stuff. So I would I compartmentalize it, you know, because some of that kind of stuff, you know, is calming. But there's certain places we actually don't allow. T dinner table, classroom, church, we don't allow it there. We have a question up here. Um, I've noticed a lot of our current education, the way they, they process stuff is uh, standardized tests. A lot of it is you have to pass the SAT, the SAR test. Um, do you feel that that hinders, like you feel that that's currently hindering our education system in the way that teachers teach? students in the way that, like you said, certain ones are taught, you know, in our better math, there's a better English class because we have to set that bar at a certain standard. Do you believe that is only? Well, I think that, you think that, you know, teachers need to get more creative on um, teaching the kids math, because what I've heard isn't so much a problem with the tests, but not being very creative in how math is taught. Because I just talked to some teachers that run a real hands-on kind, of, uh, kind of classes and they use the international test, and the kids are at the, their kids are at the 95th percentile on the international test, not some watered down state test. So I don't think it's so much a test sort of problem. You know, making people do endless drills, I don't think it's the way to teach kids how to, how to pass tests. First of all, they gotta know how to read. I've been a professor now for 21 years. I've also talked to a lot of my uh, colleagues and in the last 10 years, I'm seeing a lot more problems with lousy writing skills. I'm not talking about handwriting. Uh, you know, critical thinking, uh, you know, composing a paragraph. I just was reading an article in the paper that the business community is getting really fed up with the business schools because 
you know, students coming out of business schools don't know how to write, how to put their thoughts together <coughs> and think critically. Okay, you go on the internet, what's rubbish and what's the good stuff on the internet? I've solved a lot of my own health problems by looking up stuff on Dr. Google, but there's also <laughs> uh, a lot of garbage there, people selling all kinds of garbage you don't want. You've got to sort that out from the good stuff. And I think there's a great need for teaching critical thinking skills, writing skills. See, when I was in elementary school, and I was a bad student, you know, you'd write a little composition about your Christmas vacation, and then, then the teacher would red mark it up, and then I had to correct it. I did that in college. That's how you learn how to write. Someone's got to copy edit your work and then make you correct it. And I think we're not doing enough of that sort of stuff. Just learning how to, how to write. Got a question over here? Because I was a horrible student in high school, but by the time I was in ninth grade and I goofed all around in high school, I got to write better than some of the kids we're, we're seeing today. And then I just read the papers at the community colleges are spending huge amounts of time just teaching kids basic math and writing. You see, I don't think a test is so much an issue. I think it's, uh, uh, we need to get a lot more creative in, in working math and reading into a lot of other activities. Okay, let's take like the auto shop class. Well, if you want to understand all computer systems and you've they, got these cars, I mean, I think you're going to have to be able to read to do that and, and work math out of these things. You know, I just found out that algebra can be used to calculate flows in the hydraulic systems. Well, that's a subject I'm really interested in because it involves cat squeeze shoots. Well, maybe I might have learned some algebra that way. <laughs> but I certainly couldn't learn it the abstract way. Dr. Grant, you got a question over here? Okay. <laughs> you just every time. Um, I know that you went away to a private school, is that correct? Yeah, I did. Yeah. And I'm wondering, I, what I have found in the whole public and private thing, so much depends so much on the particular school and the particular situation. Okay. I travel all around the country. I have seen situations where I had friends that sent their kid to the most, this is a normal, smart little geeky kid, to the most expensive schools back east. This would be a kid in fourth grade, and they, they hated it. You know, yes. it, 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 and, then, and then he went to some other different school, and then then it, it worked just fine. So much of it depends on the particular situation. And the school, et cetera. That's right. And the, right. And the particular people, particular parents, and the particular teachers. Because in defending teachers, I've had teachers ripping their hair out coming up to me saying, well, I can't get the parents to do any discipline on this kid. You know, so I've heard the other side of it too. And just traveling around, there's about, I know a lot of parents overworked, you know, they might be, you know, both parents are working, but there's just, you know, the, you know then the parents and the teacher got to get on the same page. You see, mother and my third grade teacher worked together. Like, I was naughty at school, there was a consequence, no TV that night. Was that public school? <laughs> it was a private school, but it was a normal school. The, the, the school I went to as a young child, would be very similar to a small rural public school. They had 100 students, grades kindergarten through sixth grade, and I've been in small rural public schools that would have been very similar. Now, and there were 12 kids in the classroom. If I'd been stuck in a classroom, like today's type of classroom, 30 kids kind of chaotic doing different things, that would not have worked without an aid. Because I noticed in, in the film you had a fantastic I heard you refer to earlier. Um, well, my science teacher, yeah. yes. This was phenomenal for you. Well, I'm, I'm concerned, concerned that we don't have enough science teachers. I mean, I've, I'm, we, and we're losing all the, you know, the hands-on things like shop and stuff like that. But there's a lot of hands-on stuff you can do that's not expensive. When I went up to this Rochester, Minnesota science fair, I mean, half the projects in there probably cost $20 to do, you know, which is household stuff. You know, the, there's a lot, you know, if you've got creative teaching, you can do a lot of creative things with stuff that's not really expensive. Okay. Hi there. Hi there. Um, I wanted to know and ask you a question. When you were younger, when you used to like throw the rages, where you used to throw things and all, what exactly was going through your mind during the 
when you were doing that? Doing which things? Like when you were throwing rages and you were throwing like stuff. Well, when I was like, I got kicked out of school throwing a book at a girl, it teased me. They called me a retard and I bounced a book off her head. <laughs> I got kicked out of ninth grade for that. Dr. Grant, you got a question over here? Okay. Um, what would you think about, you know how like the media and like, like movies, they portray people with like, the disorders, like learning disabilities, they portray them in such a negative way. Do you think that's kind of affected how people think of people with like learning disabilities? They think of them as sort of like like someone who is not normal in society. We're gonna have to start showing what we can do. Because the thing I learned in my business, I started my livestock business, and you can go to my website, Grandon.com. I'm gonna put that up there because that's got all my livestock stuff on it. And I started that business freelance. Just one little job at a time. Uh, one little project at a time. And I made a portfolio of pictures and drawings because I sold my work and not myself. Now there's a lot of famous scientists and artists you know, that had problems. Like the guy who started Jet Blue It was ADHD. Uh, there's an article in Fortune magazine, that's a big business magazine, on dyslexic CEOs. I think you can go, just go on Google, type in Fortune magazine, dyslexic CEOs, and you can find it. You know, there's, there's certain abilities that a lot of these, these people have because the skills tend to be uneven. And I think we need to be emphasizing a lot of the, you know, really good things they've done. I mean, half Silicon Valley's got some autism. You know, mild autism, geeks and nerds, it's the same thing. We need to be showing off, you know, the good stuff, you know, we can do. And that's why in the movie I really liked seeing my drawing out there on the table because, you know, people thought it was really weird when I started in the 70s. But then I whip out one of my drawings and show it, and they go, oh, you did that? Then I started to get some respect. I think we need to be just showing stuff that we can do. Jennifer, we have one up here. Okay. Um, also, getting my business started was a lot of hard work. You know, I didn't learn, learn. Uh, I spent three years just going around all these feed yards learning. And there's also a book by John Robinson called Look Me in the Eye. He's coming out with a new book called Be Different. And he learned all this electrical engineering stuff. And he managed to go to the university, and the guys in the lab let him go in the physics labs. That's probably illegal, but that's uh, what got him turned on. If he hadn't done that, he would have gone nowhere fast. Okay, well, somebody's got the mic now? Yep. She has the mic. Um, I think we'll do two or three more questions, and that probably will be it. Ever since I was in high school, I've been diagnosed with epilepsy, plus another mental disorder. Well, epilepsy is actually, well, you see, epilepsy is actually a neurological disorder. Neurological. It's a neurological disorder, and autism is a neurological disorder. So in other words, you probably got a little slow with the epilepsy, you got some sensory problems. You know, sometimes you can, you can work on, you know, like if you go to a sports bar and there's like five TVs going on in there, is that hard for you? Yes. Well, that's some of the, some of the sensory issues. See, the sensory issues are happening in conjunction with a lot of other things, not just with autism. And they're one of the things that really needs to be studied. But lots of people have got sensory issues. You look at like uh, impressionistic art and cubist art, I'm gonna bet you the people that invented that had visual processing problems. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna do two more here. questions and then I'll be Got one over here? Okay. Hi. Um, I uh, am a person, I go to school here, but um, I have, um, for a while, I, I, I have sensory difficulties with yeah. a lot of stuff, and I was wondering, um, doing work experience and stuff, involve, um, and being hands-on involves a lot of sensory interactions, so did you have to um, overcome any of that in your learning Well, process? I mean, I had to use power saws, and I don't really like the sound of it. I mean, one of the things you can do is you can wear earplugs, but I want to warn you, if you wear earplugs, you can't wear them all the time. Because yeah. if you wear them all the time, you'll make your brain more sensitive. 
They've got to be off half of the day. Um, sometimes, you know, you, you know, I've gotten now where I can tolerate those sounds. Okay, let's say you were using a power saw. Well, I can turn on the saw and cut like a half an inch of a board. You know, and then gradually you can sometimes desensitize it, especially when you're initiating that, uh, that sound. Because even now I don't really like the sound of power saws. So it's but I use them. But, so it's you acclimatized to it? You, you can sometimes acclimatize to it. You know, now, what, what, what is your problem? You see, you've got to be specific. What sense of oh, problem do you um, have? It's uh, more, uh, I'm sensitive to sensory. It, I have trouble with lots of sensory input, so, and I also have transitional stress, which makes it harder to kind of, I can push past the barrier, and then I can, Get. When you say transitional stress, you mean going to something new? Yeah. Well, sometimes you have to just do it. <laughs> and then, yeah, now some of the, <laughs> some of the um, uh, when I gave my very first talk in graduate school, I panicked and I walked out. And, and that would be transitional sorts of things. Now, some of these visual processing problems, they're some of the worst. Because I've seen people where they absolutely don't seem to habituate the fluorescent lights where some of the sound sensitivity, you can sometimes habituate to some of that, and the touch, touch. And the touch, touch sensitivity, um, I've, I've gotten to where I don't have it in my hands anymore. Okay. I, got, I got my hands are desensitized. I still have it on my legs, but I wear soft things against my legs. Okay. See, one of the things you've got to look at, what is the specific problem, and what is the thing that you want to do? What are you good at doing? I'm good at thinking and being creative. What kind of creative? Being real abstract. Uh, innovation. What? Uh, innovative. What, what have you innovated? What have you um, innovated? I like to problem solve, find solutions to different Well, you see, you're talking very, very abstract. Oh, okay. Let's start talking about what is a skill, how can you take your skills and do something other people want? Like, I, like I, I got all fixated on camera squeeze shoots in my squeezing machine. Yeah. And I used to talk about it endlessly. People don't want to talk about cat shoots. They want me to design cat shoots. See, I had to take that interest, turn it into something other people want. They wanted me to design for X, not talk about it. I like space travel. Well, I don't think I... Uh, you've got to find something that, you, that you're good at doing that's a skill that other people want. Yeah. Like one of the first things I ever did is I painted signs. And one of the first sign jobs I had was to make signs for a beauty shop, and I certainly couldn't put a catalog on it. <laughs> so I, had to, I had to make a sign that a beauty shop would want. Those I had to take my ability and make stuff that other people would actually want. Mm -hmm. you know, so you've got to start figuring out how you can use, what was your, when we're trying to look at what would be a good job, what was your best subject in school? Uh, history. History, okay. Yeah. And, uh, like history. well, maybe you'd be good at doing writing, maybe you'd be good at doing some journalism types of things. Oh, okay. You know, that might be something you'd be good at doing. Well, you just start out one little job at a time, you know, you know, writing for a local community newsletter or something. So you start building up a portfolio. <coughs> and the other thing online, you type on Word, and then the next day, you post it on a website somewhere. Don't ever type directly on a website. You'll push send and wish you had it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I'm wondering what would cause people to have certain obsessions? Like, for example, I'm currently at my new school. As far as uh, the Ryan Academy, there are certain talks that people love to talk about. I'm banned from talking about Pokemon, and um, there's a lot of other things that are Well, there's always fads. fads. I mean, when in the 50s, it was hula hoops. Oh, that's all. Hula hoops were a big fad in the 50s. But I actually was you know, pretty good at doing that. I, you know, I had my obsessions on, on you know, things that I really liked. Kites was one of my big things. And one of the reasons I like kites is they were visually stimulating. You know, and people on the spectrum often tend to get obsessed with something. But it's good to try to get obsessed with something that you can turn into a really great hobby that you can enjoy with other people, or something you can turn into a career. 
And I think I'm going to end there, and I'll be out at the book table. And I want to thank everybody for coming.